This is The Camp with Zach Heilprin and the Athletics' Jesse Temple. Yes, welcome into The Camp. I'm Zach Heilprin. A little bit different show today. Going to be finishing up our series on the 1993 Wisconsin Badgers by talking to former Wisconsin linebacker Chris Hine. Get into a lot of uh, what it was like for him as a player growing up in the state, walking on at Wisconsin, going through his career to being uh, a vital piece of the 1993 Wisconsin defense and just his experience throughout that entire year. We'll get to that here, coming up here in a little bit. Before we get there, uh, just wanted to go through a few things in terms of the timing here. So Jesse, obviously, as you can see, not with me. He'll be back with me on Tuesday as we look back at Monday night's practice. The Badgers are going to be on the field Monday night, 7 o'clock down in Platteville. It's the first time or it's the last practice there in Platteville before they come back to Madison. They're going to be off on Tuesday. So Jesse and I will break down what we see on, on Monday night. Not exactly sure what we're going to see. Uh, I asked, you know, is it going to be a scrimmage? We, I mean, we haven't seen with them. We haven't seen them in pads yet, so it would be kind of weird to, to scrimmage without having been in pads yet. We've seen them in the shoulder pads, but they haven't been in full pads yet. So I, maybe we expect to see them in full pads on Monday night. And uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty to take from that practice. And Jesse will be with me on Tuesday to do that. Um, before we get to Chris, I do want to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that that did happen on Sunday in Sunday's practice, because there were. It was quite festive and quite competitive and quite uh, the day in terms of the offense, which we haven't necessarily set a ton of this year to this point you know there's been some plays here and there but it felt like it's been a little bit inconsistent from the offense on Sunday there was some consistency and I thought by far maybe by far is a little bit too much but certainly easily easily Tanner Mordecai's best day ton of really really good balls to guys guys are making plays for him that's that that also stands out but we'll start at the beginning of practice because they do these competitive one-on-one drills to start practice almost uh, every day so far down in Platteville. And some days it's been one-on-one -on -one pass rushing drills. Sometimes it's been just, you know, who can move who out of this area, that type of stuff. Today on Sunday was the wide receivers one-on-one, -on -one, just a little five, uh, maybe five yards. It was essentially a, a goal line drill. One-on-one -on -one, cornerback DB versus the wide receiver. And wide receivers had some reps. And they put most of them, most of them scored. Um, but what this played out like was Skylar Bell and Jason Matry. Skylar Bell went first and got his guy. And as soon as he got his guy, he got in Jason Matry's face, who was not the guy he was guarding. It was not the guy that was guarding him and just talking to him, talking to him. And Jason Matry went out there and he got Will Paul. And Will Paul made a great catch. And uh, there was some more talking between Skylar Bell and Jason Matry. And finally, like this, this last rep, it was going to be one of the backup wide receivers, one of the backup DBs. And Luke Fickle just said, no, no, we're not. No, that's not how this is ending. And he grabbed Skylar Bell. He threw him in there. And then Jason Matry walked out, grabbed the corner, pulled him out of there and said, this can be a one-on-one. -on -one. And they went one-on-one -on -one, and Jason Matry had great coverage. He was right on top of him. Skylar Bell wasn't able to shake him at all. But the pass was right where it needed to be, this little back shoulder pass, and he made a great catch. Uh, obviously, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see it. Uh, we got some good footage from that. They uh, they let Jason Major have it. The entire wide receiver core, including, including wide receiver coach Mike Brown, let him have it after that play. But that's just the type of, I think, um, intensity that we've seen certainly uh, between the DBs and the wide receivers. And it's a lot of it's new guys bringing this intensity. Uh, it was Bryson green. It's been CJ Williams. It's been Jason Matry. Like we, it's been Jonas Declona who had another great rep in that one-on-one -on -one and has really, I think turned heads and I think has a bright, bright future. It's, it's, it's becoming more and more clear to me why they were so intent on getting him to Wisconsin, um, you know, and, you know, going down and, flying down the day after his his he visited was he visited Wisconsin they flew down and they saw him right away again I'm starting to see why um he has been just uh, fantastic so far in fall camp but just, just the competitive competitiveness between the two has been 
um, amazing to see. But going back to Chandler Mordecai in the, in the day that he had, um, he had just a, a great throw down the sideline to Jack Pugh. He had a fantastic 18-yard touchdown to Chimray DK. C.J. Williams on a slant uh, that he just barely beat Ricardo Holman. Ricardo Holman had great coverage, and uh, it was a little eight-yard touchdown. They did a lot of they did a lot of red zone and, and goal line action today, so there were a lot of touchdowns. And anybody that saw their Twitter account, they had a drum up there. Uh, Every time you scored a touchdown, you could go bang the drum, and uh, Bryson Green broke the jump broke the drum and apparently there's another one on the way but um there there was a ton of fun for the offense and that not, hasn't necessarily been the case through the first four days of camp day five was definitely a day for the offense and it's not like the defense didn't make some plays they did um but there were a lot of really big time plays by uh by a bunch of different receivers i mean uh keon says lewis had a big day um Try to think some some of the other guys, uh, Skyler Bell, like they, it was just a day for, it was just a day for the wide receivers, man. Uh, they had, they have not always had that so far in camp, as I've said. So uh, that certainly stood out. There was also some field goal kicking. I think that may be a little bit of a concern for folks. Uh, Nathaniel Vakos has been quite good was in the other session that we got to see him. He was four for five uh, today. He went, uh, I believe two for four. Missed from 34, he missed from 38, he hit from 29, and he hit from 31. And uh, Nate Van Zelst was three for three, hit from 28, hit an extra point, and hit from 30. So it's not like they were kicking long distances. Um, earlier, you know, when we, we talked about it on Saturday, where both went, you know, at Vakos went four for five, and he was just barely off on a 46 yarder, and Nate Van Zelst went three for four. So we'll see what that looks like tomorrow night. Uh, or should say Monday night, and then when they get back to Camp Randall and, and whether there is a competition again, I don't I don't think there is, but if there wasn't there was room for something to open up, maybe Sunday was it was it. So uh, a couple other notes, good news: Tommy McIntosh also returned to action. Uh, Chris Brooks Jr. still working his way back after that that broken leg that he had in the spring. I mean, he was off to a flying start. He was as impressive as any wide receiver in the spring before his injury. So uh, we'll see what, I mean, they have an a, a embarrassment of depth at wide receiver. I mean, Tammy, Tommy, uh, Tommy McIntosh, I can say it. Tommy McIntosh looked great in the spring too and made some big plays. So they've got some, obviously the older guys at the position, but they got some younger guys too that I think people should be, um, excited about. We also saw them under center for the first time. And uh, didn't feel didn't feel uh, totally good for them. I would say that. Um, I don't know. I'm probably not saying that in the in a way that sounds good. It didn't feel like natural. It didn't feel natural for them. And that's just crazy to say, considering the last 30 years, but when you think about it, Braden Locke never was under center in Kyle in high school. T Tanner Mordecai never under center in high school or college. So it's, it, it is, it probably is a little bit in, unnatural. And the first one, you know, Locke, I think threw the ball to the back of the end zone and it was incomplete. Tanner Mordecai though, later threw a touchdown uh, after coming off the center, his play action fake probably leaves a little bit to be desired, but again, what do you expect when you haven't been under center pretty much uh, your entire life? And I'm sure that's been the case for Tanner Mordecai. So um, one other injury note, Ches Malusi held out of practice after the big shot that he took on Saturday from Kamoi Latu. It was just out of abundance of caution. Uh, he was out there. We saw him. Uh, he went through some of the individual stuff, but didn't do any, any of the team drills, and there was no contact for him. So um, we'll see if uh, that's going to be an extended absence or they're just you know really being really, really cautious with him. Uh, it allowed Jackson Aker and Kay Giacomelli to get some more reps because they kind of limited Braylon Allen as well in these team periods. And uh, both both look good. Both look good. Both of them have stayed healthy. And I think uh, that's certainly a, a huge thing for, for both because um, they're fighting for a third spot that is wide open. And we know the injury, injury history with Ches Malusi. We know the injury history with Braylon Allen. You would think at some point here, maybe those guys will need, be, uh, need to be counted on. But um, 
I know everybody at home is probably like, don't say that, knock on wood, but um, you're going to, I think they're going to need a third at some point. So um, good to see those two guys out there. All right. That is just a little quick look into Sunday's practice. We will be back, as I said, on Tuesday to recap uh, a little bit deeper recap of Sunday's practice. And then obviously what we see on Monday night, the final practice in Platteville before they head back to campus. All right, let's get to the interview with Chris Hine, the former Wisconsin linebacker, talking about the 1993 Badgers. This is going to serve as the final piece of our series. If you missed the first parts, uh, we have three parts. It was all from different perspectives. We got the perspective from a coach, Barry Alvarez. We got a perspective from the media with Jay Wilson, the former uh, news director or the uh, sports director at Channel 27 and Channel 3. We got a football administration aspect of it with Steve Malchow, who is the sports information director. And today, we will do the perspective of the player, Chris Hine. Here he is. And we do bring in former Wisconsin linebacker, Chris Hine. Chris, thanks for taking the time. Uh, uh, this has been a really enjoyable thing for me to do. I I, I don't want to make you – I'm not going to make you feel old, but uh, I was 12 years old in 1993, and uh, it's like second – It's it's still vivid in my mind. And I imagine that's probably the same – for you, but I want to start a few years before that in 1990, uh, Barry Alvarez shows up. I've been asking this to start every single one of these. And that is how bad were things when he first showed up? Well, I'm fortunate for me. Uh, you know, I came in in the fall of that year. So, um, you know, I heard a lot of stories of, of the purge that took place maybe in the spring, <laughs> in the spring of 1990. I was still a, a high school senior at that time and and um, finishing up my, my high school career at Plymouth. Um, so I heard a lot of stories from the guys that, that were still there when uh, when I arrived in, in the fall, in the fall of 90. Um, you know, just knowing that coaching staff uh, they didn't ease up, you know, in the fall of 90, uh, that's for sure. So, um, you know, what it was like when Morton was there, you know, other than as a fan, I remember going to a game my senior year against Minnesota, um, a friend of mine from high school got some free tickets. His sister went to school there. Um, and, uh, we hung out for like a quarter or two. There were about 20,000 people in the stands and, and um, I think they ended up, we left before the game ended. We could have sat wherever we wanted. Um, they ended up winning the game. So I think that maybe was, you know, for me, uh, my impression of, of Badger football firsthand at that time. Sure. I mean, I'd always grown up a fan. I loved the Badgers. I, I grew up in Wisconsin, Brewers, Badgers, Packers, Bucks. I mean, I was listening to everything on 620 watching the Badgers when they're on TV, but, uh, so I was a fan, but, um, hadn't been to a game ever before. And, uh, yeah, that was, that was kind of eye opening. It was different than going to Lambeau and seeing the the Packers, which I had also that, that fall. You know, it's, it's funny. You mentioned you growing up rooting for those teams. And I, I think that's certainly the case, but it felt like at least for, in my childhood, and I grew up in the state as well, um, that you liked the Badgers. Our family had season tickets all the way back to 1953. So we we were obviously Badger fans growing up, but it felt like you also had to have like a second team, it, like in college. <laughs> it was yeah. like, because they just weren't very good in basketball and football. It just, it wasn't any good. So you had to have somebody else to root for. Um, that's just my, this is how I was thinking in that time. I think my second team was like North Carolina. So I was a real bandwagon jumper at, uh, at that point, um, specifically to basketball, but um, you know, in terms for you, you were uh, a very good high school player, but yeah. you didn't get an offer from Wisconsin coming out of high school, uh, out of Plymouth. You were a walk-on. Um, did you have opportunities to go elsewhere? And, and what drew yeah. you to Wisconsin? Yeah, there's kind of an interesting story. I mean, you know, this is aging myself again, 1990. This is, uh, you know, the internet didn't exist for those younger, younger people out there. Cell phones weren't a thing. Um, you know, I was, I, I did have a very successful high school career. It was all state in basketball, all state in football. Um, but nobody really knew who I was. Plymouth, Wisconsin wasn't known for cranking out division one athletes. And at that time, and, 
And I think a lot of it was word of mouth. So uh, we didn't have Huddle, which is a great tool right now for, for high school kids. And there's just so many options and you can get yourself out there so easily. Um, so the the only real interest I had came from Grand Valley State in Michigan, which was a very successful Division II program. Um, and that only happened because a, a local college coach here at Lakeland University, which is a very small college uh, in Howard's Grove, Wisconsin, actually. Um, he knew like an assistant at Grand Valley State and said, hey, you got to take a look at this kid. So so my dad and I drove to Grand Valley State, I drove to Grand Rapids in like, I, I think it was like March of, two, of 1990. They kind of put me through a combine there. I threw for them. I was a quarterback in high school in the safety. Uh, <laughs> I remember they we were in a gym. They had me do a pro agility, like all these things. Asked me vertical. I, and I told them, well, give me a basketball. I, I threw it off the backboard one hand dunked a basketball and they're like, okay, your vertical is pretty good. Um, so they offered me then after that visit. And, uh, that was all I had at the time. And uh, I remember talking with my dad that night at, and, um, the next morning I just told her coach that, you know, I had a walk on offer at Wisconsin and I grew up a Badger fan as difficult as it might've been. And I just really wanted to give division one football a try. And he, kind of told me he thought I was making a mistake and, and but you know and gave me another week he said he'd call me in a week and make sure that's what I wanted to do and and he did and 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 I held steady to it so that was it though I mean I had a lot of interest from the the you know Whitewaters and Oshkosh and Eau Claire but as far as far as scholarships it was it was Grand Valley State or or walk on at Wisconsin so you, you talk yeah you talk about the alley-oop uh, or the uh you know the dunks you had a nickname, wasn't yeah. it? Was was it uh, was it Heine Hops? I think uh, Hops was the was the nickname. Yeah, uh, Dwight Reese, who was an outside linebacker, um, who graduated, you know, ninety ninety two, right before the, the Rose Bowl year. He he started at my position before me. He had given me that nickname of Heine Hops, and because of basketball, and just, you know, we we all played a lot of pickup basketball, so guys guys kind of knew who could play and who couldn't play, and. Yeah, that 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 became my nickname, uh, Hops or or Heine Hops. So Coach Palermo would still call me that to this day when I see him. So and a lot of the guys. Yeah. So you walk on at Wisconsin, you you work your way up, and in spring of 1993, you move into a uh, a starting role. There was a bunch of returning players elsewhere on that defense. Um, I think I read that you didn't when when you did an interview with somebody uh, in, in April of that year, you, you didn't want to be the weak link on that defense uh when did you feel like you started to be long with that group does was there a moment within the spring or maybe to start the season that uh, all of a sudden you're like yeah i i can do this um i had built up some confidence through the, the the prior years i think actually even when i initially came to wisconsin as a walk-on coach alvarez you know, at, at that time, the, the freshmen came in for three days before any of the varsity players. So we kind of had three days just to get acclimated with the coaches, learn the system and things like that. And and Coach Alvarez had called me in the like this my second day there and uh, into his office and said, hey, you're going to be a scholarship player here someday. So he gave me confidence like day two that I that I ever stepped on campus and then I was able to to earn a, uh, a red shirt in my first year, but then was able to earn a letter the next two years on special teams, uh, was on all four special teams, punt, punt, return, kick, kick, return, uh, my freshman year, same my sophomore year, got on the field a little bit in some, some big games, you know, and some meaningful moments against Iowa my sophomore year. So, so I built up a little bit of confidence, but, but you're right. We had a lot of returning guys back that, that, you know, had earned their stripes in the Big Ten and were well respected. And I certainly didn't want to be viewed as, you know, let's let's attack this this kid or let's attack number fifty. You know, he's he's a soft part on their defense. So um, I think that spring I certainly started to feel like I belonged. I'd some put some really good practices together. Was competing for the spot with Chad Cascadden, who was a heck of an athlete himself, and went on to play in the NFL and. Um, so him and I pushed each other and coach Palermo was, 
you know, obviously got the best out of, out of his guys and has been, an, you know, was just a, a legendary coach and been successful a lot of different places. So, so that spring, I, I, I had some really good practices and I was playing against Mike Rowan every day, who was a, a great tight end and played in the NFL as well. And, um, so I think that spring, but I, but I built up some confidence going into that, going into that, that opportunity that spring. You, you mentioned John Palermo and he obviously went on and coached the defensive line for a while after uh, coaching linebackers. Uh, he's got a pretty colorful vocabulary. I think <laughs> that is that accurate. What, what, what was that like? Cause there, there are some legendary stories about him for sure. Yeah. Yeah. He he's legendary. I think, um, for my parents, they were a little, it was, it was a little unsettling for them as they came to Badger games our first couple of years. And that guy's going to be your coach. And, you know, they could hear him uh, coaching Dwight Reese from row 15 section H, you know, or a lot of the parents are. And, and so I think for them, they were, they were probably a little, a little more nervous than I was, you know, I, um, the thing about coach Palermo is he was, he was going to coach you hard, but, but you, like I always felt like, and I knew that he had my back at the end of the day. And, and, you know, when we walked off the field, it was different. Um, but yeah, he, he demanded excellence on the field. And and that was really that whole staff. I mean, their, their attention to detail, their energy, they were all young, <laughs> much younger than I am now. I think they're, you know, almost all in their thirties. Some of them might've been in their their upper twenties. I'm not, you know, coach Norvell. I mean, they were all, coach McCarney as a D coordinator was, they were all young. They had a ton of energy. They, they demanded excellence. They'd all come from winning programs. So he fit right in with all of them, you know, I and mean, that's just, they all coached hard and, uh, and that's the culture that they built, that the program was built around that toughness, expectations of excellence, and, you know, that's, that's why we were able, I think, to turn around the program pretty quickly, you know, when you look at where it was in 90 and then getting to a Rose Bowl in 93. So going into that season, uh, you guys open it with a, with a big win against Nevada. Uh, but leading into that game, what were your expectations? Because it had been a while since you'd been to a bowl game. I think it was 1984 since you had been to a bowl game or the, the program had been to a bowl game. You came so close the year before for losing to Northwestern in that, in that final game. Um, what was the expectations like? What were the, in the, in the locker room when you guys were thinking about what was possible that year? Yeah. You know, coming so close the year before and, and losing at Northwestern in a heartbreaking manner, um, you know, I remember we kind of already had the bowl game lined up. I think it was like we were going to Louisiana, I believe. It was like the Independence Bowl was there waiting for us. And and that just seemed like something so far away a couple of years earlier. So we, we were so close the year before that I, I think all of us knew that we had a chance um going into that to that next year, but we had to learn how to win on a consistent basis. And that's for anybody who's played sports and and been in a situation where you go from worst to first, I mean, that's probably the biggest challenge. And so were we going to be able to find a way to win games like the Northwestern game that we had been finding, you know, ways to lose at Wisconsin previously? Um, for me, I think the biggest thing, one of the biggest things, and I've said this in a couple of interviews previously is uh, at our preseason camp, like the first day when we were out at the seminary that fall, in August, uh, when Coach Alvarez got the team together, he kind of he kind of went over player by player, position by position, like what we had and what we were bringing to the table, and and kind of went through like the the strengths of each of our players at each position, and and really laid out to us like why can't we win this year, and we should be winning. This should be the expectation, and for me that hit home because it was such a stark contrast to. Uh, August of 1990, when <laughs> we kind of had a similar meeting about team goals, and Nick Polzinski at the time was a team captain, and kind of, you know, trying to get everybody excited. Mentioned, you know, our goal sh we should go undefeated in the Big Ten, and Coach Alvarez like shut it down immediately. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> like you know, just so we always viewed him. I always viewed Coach Alvarez as he's gonna like he's not gonna lie to us. He's gonna shoot you straight. Coach Palermo's the same way. Like they're going to tell you if you 
you uh if they thought you were full of full of it they were going to let you know if they thought you made a mistake they were going to let you know um so for him to say that and be willing to say it to us to start the season and not feel like we were going to take it the wrong way or or be lazy and complacent because he was putting he's saying we should have expectations uh that meant a lot because I knew he wouldn't tell us that if he didn't think it was true and he didn't believe it and uh he didn't think it was going to help us be better so to me that was a moment where I then you can get into the season and there's certainly moments during the season where where you realize hey we're we've we might we might have turned the corner here and I feel like one of those turning points came in week two when you guys played down at SMU, a team that was coming off essentially the death penalty was was not a very good program at that time. And you guys go in there and the first half was not very good, right? I mean, you guys didn't you guys didn't play great, um, but you found a way to come back in the second half. You win it 24 to 16 to move to 2 and 0. Do you remember uh, in the locker room, maybe what was said at halftime? Uh, I'm sure there was some colorful language, but just like, come on, guys, we're better than this. I mean, you know, right. I'm old. So this was 30 years ago. So, right. And some of the, some of the guys I played with are, are phenomenal. I don't know how they remember the kind of details. Um, I, I don't, for me, you know, it's more of a looking back 30 years. It's, it's kind of a highlight video memory for me. Sure. You know, it's a collage for me. Um, certainly I remember the moments but details about a, a halftime speech no but you're absolutely right I remember us not playing well in the first half I remember walking into that stadium too and it was just so different than anything you'd see in the Big Ten I think it only sat like 20,000 people at the time roughly um, it, you know it wasn't the big cavernous Camp Randall and the Big Ten stadiums we were used to so it was a different feel and and uh, certainly played a bad first half. You're right. And, and I do remember us putting it together, finding a way to punch it in the end zone in the second half and finding a way to win a game that in the past we would have found a way to lose. So 100% agree that, that that game on the road, you know, a long way from Camp Randall, uh, facing adversary, adversity, not playing well, and then turning it around, getting momentum shifted, uh, finding a way to win a game that that we would have lost in the past, that game stands out uh, for sure. So you get that going. You get you open in the non conference three and zero. You go and beat Iowa State the next week. Then you get into Big Ten play, and you are really good to start Big Ten play, right? You like you beat Indiana, you beat Northwestern, you beat Purdue, and then you go to Minneapolis. And the defense played well, but it was hard to overcome all the all the turnovers. So you have that little bit of a bump right in your in your season but you have to turn it around very very quickly because the next week is Michigan mm -hmm. and Michigan was thought to be the favorite going into this into the end of the year they had been the they had won the Big Ten a ton of times in a row going into this and so they get the uh they come to Camp Randall and it's uh a remarkable game for the defense I mean just an insane game for the defense and you were part of the play that essentially clinched the game a fourth down stop um, just barely shy of the sticks there. Uh, can you take me through that? Can you take, I know you said memories, you know, well, it's, hard, that, it's hard, but I'm sure that well, one sticks out. Yeah, it does. And, and talking about the locker room, like that's one instance where like pregame, uh, I do have a memory in our locker room of, of the coaches coming, you know, the specialists go out early. I was a linebacker. We went out a little bit later. I remember some of the coaches coming down and, and being really cranked up about how Michigan's disrespecting us and they're dancing, you know, on, on our 50. And, you know, so, so that I, I clearly remember like just getting charged up before we even left the locker room, just about exactly what you talked about. You know, they were Michigan, we were Wisconsin, we were a fraud now, you know, everybody believed. And then we go and lay an egg in Minnesota and lose to the Gophers. And now we're just going to get, you know, rolled over by Michigan because you know we're a fraud and they're the real deal um so yeah I mean that I remember and the coaches just coming with a lot of energy before we even walked up for pregame um and then the, just the whole atmosphere of the game was was amazing and and unbelievable and the energy in Camp Randall in those days uh 
okay. you know, when you're turning, when you're turning around and fans like myself growing up in Wisconsin, yourself, like to see the Badgers playing so well and, and the fans were so hungry and thirsty for that, that, that Cam Brando was just, it was insane in those days. Uh, so the atmosphere around it was, was phenomenal. Um, yeah. And then it comes down to like, it's, this is a nail biter three, three point game and we've got to try to hold on. And, and um, I was fortunate enough, got actually a little earlier in that drive had, had got a pressure on the quarterback, nearly a sack, but a great call and a great scheme by our coaches, Coach Cosgrove and the whole staff, Coach McCartney to get to get me open on a blitz. So I'd I'd had a pretty important pressure earlier in that drive, and then we got him in a fourth and eight. And and honestly, it was I just fell back on my coaching, you know, to be honest. And that's where details and that the coaches had coach and just doing your job was just something you always heard there. And I fell back on that, you know, and I think that's something as an athlete, you can get caught up in the moment and you try to do something great and you end up making a huge mistake because you're trying, trying to be a hero. Um, so for me, honestly, that play was more about this is a big play, but I'm just going to do what I got, what I'm supposed to do. And sometimes when you do what you're supposed to do and you're where you're supposed to be, big things fall in your lap. And honestly, I mean, that that particular play, I wish I could say I made a great break and a great read, and I studied that play for three hours, you know, <laughs> that week. Uh, but honestly, I was just getting a drop where I was supposed to, and and they threw the ball in my zone, and I just came up and tackled them, you know, made the tackle, which was the most important part, because obviously I, I could have missed a tackle, and it could have been a whole different thing. But, um, you know, it, it's people remember that play, and and I'm associated with that play, and that's awesome. I take a lot of pride in it, but it's a great lesson for just doing what you're supposed to do and being where you're supposed to be. Big things, great opportunities can happen if you you know if you just do those things. So, yeah, and then we sell, and then from there was you know start the celebration, and and uh, it was just a phenomenal feeling having grown up a Wisconsin kid, and and the aura of Michigan and them disrespecting us. And that was kind of the best part for me of that whole season was uh, from the beginning to the end, the Rose Bowl and UCLA just consistently being disrespected and just proving people, proving people wrong. So um, it was a great day, great moment, moment I'll never forget and a feeling I'll never forget. It's interesting. Uh, you talk about the chip on the shoulder essentially uh, because uh thought a quote from you from after that game it was quote a lot of people were kind of down on Wisconsin after last week especially nationally and this proves a lot we came back and it was kind of I think I feel like that's kind of like a, a theme in the season is just getting punched and getting back up and uh and keep fighting because you, it happened a bunch of times where you, you took a shot to the jaw whether it's the beginning of the season you know against SMU and having to come back at half or the Michigan game having to come back from losing to Minnesota the following week you go to you tie Ohio state 14, 14, which is, you know, it's, it's Ohio state and you time and that's fine, but you know, and then you have to come back the following week and uh, play. Uh, I think it was, it was Illinois. Like there, there are always just like having to fight away, find a way back. And I think that was kind of a theme of your team. I don't know if you would agree with that or not. Oh yeah. There's, there is no question. And, you know, I think it was, none of it was easy. Um, and I think a, again the credit for that really goes to coach Alvarez and the staff like it, going through it as a player it was a challenge like this was not you know I think some people say oh you win a Rose Bowl that must have been so much fun yeah the moments and those games and after and that was great but the work and the preparation that went into that was was extremely difficult and it tested your fortitude and it tested your love of football or tested but that's what allowed that built the resiliency and, and they like to use grit when we talk about Wisconsin football light, right? Like the way we were coached and the, the culture of that program, like instilled grit and resiliency within us over the years that would, you know, at that time, that was my fourth year in the program, having redshirted my first year. And so we could take a punch. Like we've proven that you, you know, if you're in Coach Alvarez's Badger program for four years. You can take a punch. Uh, 
And you're right. We, we took plenty of them and, and we came back and, and that's what allowed us to have the great season that we had that year is that resiliency and that grit that we'd earned and, you know, we'd accumulated over the years. So you beat, you beat Michigan, you tie Ohio state. Now it's kind of like, it's not in your hands, but then Ohio state the following week goes and loses to Michigan. And now all of a sudden one more win for you guys. And you're going to the Rose bowl for the first time in 31 years, that game should have been at Camp Randall. And I can't even imagine what it would have been like had it been at Camp Randall. But instead, because you guys hadn't been to a bowl game in so long, they're like, well, we want to give our guys a trip no matter what happens this season. And that trip came to Tokyo where you played Michigan State. Do you have a vivid memory of that trip, whether it's on the field or off the, yeah. field, off the field? Oh, yeah, plenty. I mean, that, you know, the preparation too, I think all, a lot of us have spoken about that. I'm, I'm, the preparation was just um, <laughs> mind-boggling, like – the level of detail that that coach Alvarez and the entire, you know, the administrative staff, I'm sure everybody was involved. I mean, they had NASA involved. They're, they're talking to NASA, about how they acclimate astronauts. Like there's just no, no stone left unturned with this, with that program and co under coach Alvarez's leadership. Yeah. So I remember having a, you know, they're giving us sunglasses and like, you know, starting a week before we leave, we have to start like an acclimation period of, we want you to put, okay, starting on Monday, you're going to put sunglasses on it, starting at five that night. And then, you know, kind of working our way backward until, you know, during the day we're walking, we're walking around with sunglasses on more to try to get our, our brains acclimated to Tokyo time. And, uh, you know, and, and it worked like we were, we were on Tokyo time before we, before we left on the flight. And then of course, a legendary 17 hour flight where they wouldn't let any of us sleep, you know, like there's literally walking around and we're on a double decker airplane with Michigan state on the bottom and we're on the top deck and the coaches and staff walking around, making sure nobody's sleeping in a 17 hour flight. So, um, yeah, I've plenty of recollections of that, the, the game, you know, the preparation up to the game, um, the game itself and the atmosphere at the game. I mean, they kind of split the stadium in half red and white pom-poms for one half of the stadium, green and white for the other. It was just a real kind of odd uh, atmosphere, much different than Camp Randall obviously would have been, but um, from a, in a weird way, it pro there were there were no distractions there. So maybe in a weird way that that may have been, a good scenario. I mean, Michigan state had to go through it all as well and they didn't have as much to play for. So, no. um, you know, in a strange way, it may have worked to our advantage, but only because our, our coaches were just so prepared and always thought of everything and, and the entire staff, it's not just the coaches, the training staff, the administrative staff. And, um, but yeah, and then to come up with that win and, uh, to celebrate it in Tokyo was, was unique as well. And, and uh, what a great experience though, just overall to have that opportunity and, and to do something that's uh, so special to the history of Wisconsin, Wisconsin football. And, and, you know, we were able to celebrate it as truly a, our, our little family then too, right? Yeah. Because your, your cousins and, you know, whoever else might've been at the game at Camp Randall, like, they weren't all flying to Tokyo to come to see that game. And so we got to kind of soak it all in together as a, as a unit and as a group as well, which I think was unique and, and special too. Yeah, for sure. They, it, for those that are having problems visualizing what it was like in Madison, just think about the 2014 and 2015 final fours where state street gets packed. That's what it was like that night uh, that uh, Michigan state there's, there's, there's video of it out there of uh, the celebration that happened in, uh, Madison, which I'm sure you would have loved to have been a part of, but uh, was still obviously pretty special to do it in Tokyo. So you guys punch your ticket to the Rose Bowl. You get out to the Rose Bowl. I, I, the, the entire week, I'm sure, was was a lot of fun. Uh, but I want to talk about the game itself because it was a fantastic defensive performance by you guys. You turn them over six times. J.J. Stokes, I think, just caught another pass, though, uh, just, just <laughs> right. now. I mean, he was, he was remarkable. Um, but that game going into it, there was a ton of disrespect from UCLA side. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I remember th them like running through 
the uh, the warm up lines that you guys were that you guys were doing and running just completely disrespecting who you guys were as a team and and who you guys were as a program like these guys are going to come in here and do this absolutely not and uh, I think maybe they thought they were trying to intimidate you guys and it just wasn't going to happen. Yeah, and it 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 even started be outside of the players like. You know, we're there a week early and and early in the week we were a lot we had some free time to to go around Pasadena and stuff. And I remember just random, you know, they may have been LA alumni or UCLA alumni, they may have been students. I don't or they were just residents of Los Angeles, like people just coming up to us when they knew we were badger football players and be like, You guys are just a bunch of farmers. You're gonna get, you know, you're gonna get your hat handed to you, like you guys can't compete. You know, we're a bunch of tractor driving, plot, slow plotting. You know, we're we're just we're gonna open up the racetrack on you guys. Literally, like these aren't even players. We're I still remember that, like just being disrespected by by people in the community there. Um, and that just served as motivation. And you know, we we knew we were underdogs going in, and um, nationally, not given a lot of. Cr- a lot of chance to to do well out there. I mean, it was their home turf and, you know, it's a Pac-10 at that time and West Coast football and all that. So, yeah, it, that was probably, though I would have had it no other way, to be honest. I don't know if that year I would have known how to play when, when you know, if people would have, you know, we would have come in like a 14-point favorite or something like that. So, it just kind of fit, fit the script for the whole season and, and for what we would had been doing. And uh, yeah, the game was, was no different. I mean, there was, there was a lot of talk, you know, with certainly some of the players on the field, but it's a lot, a lot more chatter than we would see in a typical, typical game. And yeah, JJ Stokes, he caught a lot of touch. He caught a lot of balls, but it wasn't in the end zone a whole lot. And that was kind of our, that was kind of our, our game plan going in and, and in a lot of ways, that's the kind of defense we were that year. Like we weren't filled with high profile pass rushers that, you know, they're going to be number one draft pick 22 sacks on the season or, or lockdown corner. Like we played Troy Vincent, who I had the good fortune of playing with when I was younger and just watching what a truly phenomenal NFL all pro looks like on a day in and day basis just how freakish of an athlete so that wasn't that wasn't really us that wasn't our identity defensively and we were a unit we were cohesive we like we did our job like I talked about earlier like it was a count on me defense right like we knew we knew the guy next to us was going to do with what they were supposed to do and I was going to do my job and and it was really successful and and sometimes it was bend but don't break it wasn't you know, it wasn't the the '84 Bears. I'm I'm probably uh, dating myself there, but some of the youngsters can can YouTube it. And they, you know, we we weren't the '84 Bears defense or '80 80, '85 Super Bowl. I think they were in, right? Um, that that was our style, and yeah, uh, guys just played phenomenal, and we turned them over and and so often in that game, and and just watch them get frustrated as and JJ was definitely getting the ball but he was frustrated that he wasn't getting in the end zone or making that huge play which which is what they all want right yeah yeah for sure the highlight play the highlight video play you you mentioned Ben but don't break and I think the last drive of the game is probably great a great uh, illustration of that they were able they got the ball they moved it down they got inside the 30 and then it was it was stopped but you were you were on the field for much of that and I remember you weren't like dropping you were rushing every time, which had to do have to have just been exhausting. Yeah. And for me, I mean, my position was unique. I mean, it was kind of a hybrid outside linebacker position. I didn't blitz a whole lot. It wasn't, uh, you know, certainly wasn't Nick Herbig who, you know, just graduated that kind of position. I mean, a lot of times I was, I was dropping or I was even off the line of scrimmage, but we had gone to nickel on that last drive and, and I was, got moved to almost like a DM position in the nickel, which we hadn't done a lot of that year. Yeah. And then, you know, things were just happening so fast and we weren't going to call timeouts because <laughs> we obviously didn't want the clock to stop. And, and I don't, 
you know, they eventually ran out of timeouts. So it was just, yeah, rush the passer, play after play, you know, rush back. And so I was, I was just exhausted. I, I had, you know, I hadn't been used to rushing the passer that often, certainly had blitz during the year, but, but not a whole lot. And um, it was just a, a, a great relief when, when Cook decided to pull the ball down, run, and uh, we were able to tackle him and let that clock run out. It was it was phenomenal. Did you know it was done as soon as he ran it? Or were you like well, just tackled? You know, earlier in that game, Bevel had run for a, a what yeah. was it about a twenty one yard touchdown? It 17? was. Yep. I, weird things were happening that day. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, uh, that was not on my bingo card for Bevel to rush for a touchdown in that game. So I. You know, when he took off running, I felt pretty good about it, pursuing him after blitzing. But, you know, until he was on the ground, um, you just didn't know. And you, the last thing you want to do is let up and, and until you hear the whistle. And what a phenomenal feeling once, once, once we knew it was over. So you guys get him on the ground, the clock goes to zeros, and you win the Rose Bowl, which for a kid that grew up in Wisconsin had to have been like the, just the ult- most – unsurreal or a surreal moment uh for you it's like to go from a kid watching a team that was horrible to the top of the world yeah it was amazing like it uh and all the work we had put into it and to know it, that it was all worth it and yeah as a wisconsin kid who who lived and died with all wisconsin sports and and my parents and my dad and and my community like that's one of the coolest parts about it being a Wisconsin kid, I think um, for me, just how your community just got behind the Badgers and, and seeing how much excitement there was in the community was, was amazing. And that it took so much, like that was one of the best parts about it too. Like just seeing the whole state rally behind something and feel good about something. Cause you know, at that time, the Packers hadn't been very successful. The, the Bucks were, not very good either at that there just wasn't wasn't a whole lot going on in in the state so um we were the best thing going at that time and it, and just the amount of pride and excitement around around Wisconsin football and the joy and and the smiles and and everything that went with that was was so rewarding and still to this day you know is, is one of the best memories and parts of parts of it yeah, it's pretty remarkable. That team was remarkable, and I think it still holds a pretty special place in Wisconsin football history and probably always will. Uh, it certainly will as long as I'm alive because uh, uh, it, it was remarkable just that entire season and how everything came together and um, just a really fun season to to watch and I'm sure great to play in as well. So, Chris, I really appreciate your time, and uh, thank you again. All right, thank you. All right, there he was, Chris Hine. Really appreciate his time. Really appreciate everyone's time um, in doing the series. I know this one got left, uh, kind of got lost in the shuffle, but uh, certainly do appreciate his time and and I uh, hope everybody enjoyed the series. I know that it was probably meant for people of a certain age. And as I've said throughout this time, I am of that certain age. And uh, if you guys didn't enjoy it, that's okay because I had a great time doing it. So um, either way, that's going to do it for the show today. Me and Jess will be back on Tuesday to recap what we've seen uh, in fall camp on, on Monday night. So until then, you've been listening to The Camp.